Listen, I'll do a brief review. Um, this is going to be the bride part two uh, for you, my man back there. And um, I want to teach uh, how the bride gets ready. We hear a lot of teaching. Uh, how to live in God is what I found the apostles and Jesus taught. That was the centerpiece of the gospel. Jesus said in John 15, I'm the vine, I'm your life, I'm your roots, and if you connect to me, I will flow into you, and I will produce, reproduce, I should say, or he doesn't even have to produce it, he's just full of life, but his life will flow into you. So this is true Christianity, not trying, but trusting. Trying will wear you out, or if you're real good at real disciplining yourself, you'll get prideful about how awesome you are. But if you are humble and recognize that the things God calls you to do, to, to love people in this world, is a major challenge. Amen. Even your spouse and your kids at times. Don't say amen too loud. But anyway, <laughs> these things are real in life. Learning to love. That's what, did, did Carla learn to love? Yes. And she learned to be protective of her brother. That was awesome, Sandro. But um, she was a, a tremendous illustration. I said that I, I stay in the back sometimes for several different reasons. Sometimes I can catch people that I wouldn't normally get to touch. But um, when you get a hug from Carla, it was straight, warm hearted. Every time I knew it, it's like, oh, wow. So uh, I love her. I want to put up uh, Matthew 23, 37 through 39. Um, uh, it broke down. We had a little sign. And now we have a small one, I think. But we had a sign, kind of like a flag in the middle, uh, that was that would always show you where we are here. And it was um, the gathering place. And then it said, "Under the shadow of His wings," because um, we pastored our first church 15 years. Then we merged, uh, went to Pasadena with Che and Lou, and Pam and I were pretty much most of the time we were on the road. We traveled around to all these ministries that connected with us. And then we've been pastoring this church um, 13 and a half years. So it's been um, 36 years altogether, I think. But anyway, uh, when we started this church, this was the verse he gave me. And he said, look, Rick, when I went into Jerusalem, you can look at it. He's, he's crying. He's weeping over Jerusalem. In Luke uh, 19, I think it's 41, it says he's actually weeping uh, and heaving over when he's saying this he's so distraught and he's basically saying you know you've rejected me but what I wanted is to be able to gather you in my lap so to speak right says the chicks and the wings but he wanted to gather people into himself and be their refuge be their God be their king be their forgiveness be their righteousness be their healing for their marriage be their ability to raise kids and stay connected, to be a good employee or employer. He was calling them all to be intimate with him. Psalm 91 is what he was crying out for. So he says here, um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I longed to gather your children together as a hen. So he's talking to the the city, but he's calling them, they're all his children. I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Now, I want to show you the goodness and severity of this, okay? Let's go to the next verse. Uh, look, your house is left to you desolate. And uh, you talk about that word being true. On the one hand, I love you, I want you to partake of me, I want to partake of you. On the other hand, if you don't, and uh, over a period of time, of course, uh, the church became more and more Gentile, the Jews rejected. And um, 2,000 years later, roughly, in 1997 or so, when we were traveling, I was in Poland, gone to five different countries, and the lady I was with, Irena, who is, uh, was an incredible woman that had a very large church in Poland anyway, um, at one time, and um, she said, would you like to go to Auschwitz? You know, that was one of the concentration camps. I said, I really do. She goes, well, it's going to be difficult because she goes, you get about, you know, five miles outside and you start to feel it. She goes, the whole town is still depressed. It's under a cloud. I said, well, I feel I'm supposed to go. So I went. I, 
I went with one other person, I think. And she says, I'm, I'm not going to go in. So I was in for about an hour and a half or so and walked through, walked through the ovens and all of that and uh, other places, which I won't really tell you the details. But anyway, a- after a while, it began to come on me so powerful. The grief to where I thought I cannot breathe. I wasn't being, you know, weird. It's like, my, I guess it's my heart can't take it. So I went out, and um, you could see some scribbling in the ovens as if they had come to, some of them had called upon the Lord. But um, it didn't finish with the rest of it. Uh, isn't there where it says, you will not see me? Let's go to the rest one. It says here, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. About three years ago, well, it was been four, over four years ago now, on 11-11-11, this brother David and I uh, were the coordinators and instigators and all that of this meeting we had at, um, at uh, the Rose Bowl. We rented a section off. We had 31,000 registered, and uh, we had 27 ministries from uh, Israel. And uh, one of the guys is a young man, 40-ish or so, Israel Pachtar, and he came to our church, and he was telling me how the you know, Jewish rabbis and all of them, over 300 of them one time, uh, I'm just being honest, just showing you, but they, I'll just say this way, they were not blessing him at all. And uh, I cry out for Israel. I cry out for them. I know the war is coming. I've seen part of it. And I cry out for them. But it, what I want you to get today is, behold the goodness and severity of God. That's what's in these verses. He's saying, I wanted to hold you in my arms. You've rejected me. You know, um, it varies, but uh, uh, Josephus, who is recognized as the greatest historian at that time, over a million Jews were killed at that time. Where did the believers go? They fled to Pella up north by Galilee. Some said they also went into Petra. But uh, thousands were killed and crucified on the Appian Way because they did not believe. So I want, at times, you need to be sober-minded. Reading John 15 should sober-mind you, be sober-minded. But I'm going to shift in just a moment to get into the goodness of God. But it's important that we see even today, and we should be praying for the Jews, there'll be a time when they start to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, I was touched by your friends there, you know, I got to talk to that older man. Were they Jewish, the older folks that were neighbors? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, but I got to talk with him, you know. And anyway, it was encouraging to me. But I want you to, I want you to know that. Let's look at uh, um, Romans 11, 21 and 22. I'm going to confirm this. So Jesus, on the one hand, is saying, you know, Jerusalem, I, I just want to hold you in my arms. Um, this is Paul speaking in Romans. I tell you uh, that you will, oh, excuse me. Go to, the, go to Romans 11, 21, and 22. Romans 11, 21, and 22 are similar to uh, this one. It's the goodness, and I like the old King James. It says, behold, the goodness and severity of God. A little sober-mindedness won't hurt anybody. Do you want me to just read it? Or are you okay there? Romans 11, 21, and 22. I'll, I'll just quote it, basically. He's saying that there, there was goodness toward us, and um, severity toward them, and because they had not received him. He said, therefore, uh, consider the kindness and severity of God. He's talking about the Jews who were cut off. I just showed you the verse why they were. They did not accept Jesus as Messiah. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell. Actually, what happened was he was talking about... um, Uh, an olive tree, basically, and saying that they were the original branches. They were cut off. Same thing he says in John 15. If you read it, we can be cut off. So he says here, the sternness of those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue continue in his kindness. And if they do not persist in their unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. Now, is that 22 through 24? Is it the whole point? Good. Okay. After all, if you were if you uh, were cut out, 
excuse me, after all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted in a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these natural branches, that is the Jews, be grafted in to their own olive tree? And that's what we cry out for. And how will they be grafted in? Blessed is the, are those who they, when they say, who comes in the name of, they might say Yeshua or whatever, but it's Jesus Christ. You understand? So I wanted you to uh, just see that and uh, uh, have a little uh, soberness of heart about it. But I want to switch now to the goodness of God. I want to go back and just add a little bit to Esther last week when I taught. I want to explain this a little, hopefully, a little better. It was one of the highlights for me last week because um, I was so encouraged by it myself. But in Esther, here it is, uh, make a long story short, there's um, a problem in the kingdom and the, the, the wife or the queen will not come when the king is having a big party. And the, and the guys are saying, look, if your wife doesn't come, our wives aren't going to come either. We're going to have problems in our kingdom. The women are not going to obey their husbands anymore, you know. They said, we don't know what to do. So they said, okay, well, let's look for some really good-looking girls out there and bring them in, and you choose the one you want, king, to be your queen, right? So it's okay, great. Well, the thing is, is that she's part of the captured group. She's a Jew. She's an Israelite, and, uh, but the Lord, and she's, she's also um, an orphan. So her mothers die, and she's in a captive land. Hallelujah. You know, we say, people prophesy, well, you're like a Queen Esther. Okay, well, don't just think Queen King likes me. You know, she had some very terrible things to overcome in her life, which we all do. We have a cross to bear in some way. For when the, uh, when the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai, that is her uncle, had adopted the daughter, uh, uh, the daughter of his uncle, uh, Abihail, uh, to go before the king, she asked for nothing other than what... Now this guy here, he's a eunuch, and he is the one who sets all these girls up to go before the king. And I'm using him as a type of the Holy Spirit, which I'll explain in a few minutes. But he's telling her, so she doesn't ask for anything other than what? what? Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And then Esther, because she obeyed this guy, because this guy knew, I know the king. I know the women that he likes. I know what he likes. If you listen to me, you might just win this thing. <laughs> you, know, you might just win the lottery, honey. So she, you know, so she goes along with it. Ask for nothing other than, um, did we go to verses, uh, did you get two, eight, and nine? That was the first ones, right? Two, eight, and nine. When the king's order of the edict, this was to be first, but when the king's order of the edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put there under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had in charge of the harem. Now watch this. She pleased him. Now see, this is the thing. Notice the word favor. Okay? Look it. Re your blessing comes when God gives you favor. And you know how you get favor with God? Are you ready? I'm going to tell you. You obey the Holy Spirit who is to sanctify you and to make you holy for Jesus to be able to use. That's how you get favor with God, you know. And I'll, I'll explain this later. She pleased him. Now, here she comes in. Now, this is just the sovereignty of God. She pleased him. She had most likely a humility and so forth that some of the others may not have had. She pleased him and won the favor. And immediately, he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. Now, watch this. And assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her to the uh, attendants into the what? The best place in the harem. So what I'm saying is, is that this is a type and a shadow. The Old Testament verifies the New Testament. It's a shadow. It tells us more and more. So how, how does this work? Okay. Well, I'll explain it now. Um, let's go to, J, or to Galatians uh, 5, 22 and 23. The Bible is very clear here. Jesus said, I'm a vine. I'm like a vine. And you are my branches. You must be connected to me. You know, what you do is, if you have a garden or whatever, you cut off the dead branches. Jesus said, the branches that don't abide in me, the Father will prune them and cut them off, throw them into the fire, John 15. But he says that we're to bear fruit for the glory of God. And the way that we bear fruit is, can you believe it? God supplies the ability. Isn't that awesome of him? 
because if you try to do it, it won't work. But the fruit of the Spirit is, first of all, love, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faith. It's actually the word faith. Gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, the Holy Spirit is sent to you. It actually says in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, it says, For we are sanctified, that is, set apart unto God and made holy by the Holy Spirit, by our believing of the truth. John 17, 17, Jesus prays and he says, Lord, sanctify them or set them apart as holy unto me. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. When you start having truth penetrate into your inner being, you've been a little snobby lately, but he says it so nicely, it feels good. You know, you're unforgiving toward this situation at work. You better watch, you know, it's not good that gives place to everyone. Don't go to bed angry. Remember what Paul taught you in Philippians 4. Neither give place to the devil. So the Holy Spirit, if the more that you know the Bible, which is the truth, the more material he has, right? Otherwise, he deals with your conscience in feelings. But when he has scriptures inside of you that he wants to use, he brings them right up to you and then feeds you those verses. So you read your B.I.B. Elin. But he says here that it's, it's, this, it's this yielding to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to John, or excuse me, John 7, 37 and 38. Now, this is such a major verse for me. This was huge. This is on the day of uh, Feast of Tabernacles at the last day. And it says, on the last day, uh, excuse me, in the last and the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said with a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come and we'll go to Starbucks. You know, no. I mean, I preach this a lot. They all know my bad jokes. But anyway, I'm trying to, I want you to see something again, once again. If anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. This is a whole nother ball game, you know. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 2, 2, taste and see that the Lord is good. You need to do that every morning. Jesus, you are my daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus said, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven. Taste and see that he has goodness for you today, that he has grace for you today. You must live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. And as you get to know God, you'll hear more and more coming out of his mouth. Until then, you need to read your Bible. Amen. But after a while, he'll read the Bible back to you. Okay. He'll explain it to you and quote it to you. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, you never know what's going to happen. No, here it is. Exactly. Rivers of what? Rivers of living water will flow from within him. Of this, he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. That's what it says on that next verse. Okay. The scripture of living water flow within them. Of this, he was speaking of the Spirit. Now look, here you go. You believe in Jesus and you yield to the inward promptings of the Holy Spirit. You yield to the river. You say, it doesn't feel like a river inside of me. It'll start out maybe a little bit of a trickle. You'll get breakthroughs at different times. But this is the way that you learn to live in God. You must believe in Jesus and yield to the Holy Spirit. This is one of my main teachings. Many of you have heard it for a long time. You need to hear it again. I need to hear it again. I guess it's all for me anyway. Anyway, <laughs> Romans 5.10 is a good one. Sandro smiled. That's good, Sandro. Uh, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross, right? How much more, having been reconciled, shall we now be what? Saved through what? His life, the life flow of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's awesome that he died on the cross for you. And that's awesome that he destroyed the powers of darkness. But you need to be saved daily. It's a life-giving spirit that comes into you. How does he save you? He gives you life. You know, I feel depressed. I have life for you. I'm angry. I have life for you. How, how do we get it? I'll, I'll teach you a real key one. I've already told you out of John 7. That's a very great key. That's what I learned. And you learn specifically to yield to God in his presence. So you get a good CD. You play it. You watch something on YouTube that blesses you. Listen carefully. Something that blesses your spirit. Your heart needs to be refreshed by God. It can be by a friend, it can be by a neighbor, it can be by a child, it can be, you know, whatever. But you need to know there are certain things that touch you so you can go there with your beautiful memory. 
you can think about that time. I just instantly going to a time, I'll tell you this. I don't think you've ever heard this story. I was about 11 years old, and my dad had just built my go-kart because it had broke, and he welded it. And I was, and we, we did pretty good. Uh, and uh, so I was leading this race, and out at Cornell Corners out in Azusa, and uh, right where Hungary is, it was behind that, and a long time ago. And uh, going down there, going down the straightaway, and the back end flipped up, and I flipped over. People thought I was really hurt. I wasn't and, uh, at all. And, of course, my dad was devastated and so forth. But this guy heard about me, that I was leading the race. His name was Chuck Kahn. And uh, he, uh, he had this little company. And he said, I, I think I'll try you out. So we went out to Palmdale. And uh, I didn't get to qualify. So like 13 guys. Well, I, I guess this sounds like I'm bragging. It just came to me. But I can go there because he uses it. And... Uh, I'm not, I hope I'm not bragging. So anyway, so okay, okay, okay. If my wife says I'm not bragging, I'm really not bragging. Okay, now, so I was 11, that's right. And uh, so I'm, I'm, anyway, so I can't, I can't qualify. So I'm in back, 15, cars back. And by the first lap, I'm in first place. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was awesome. Huh? Now I'm bragging, yeah. But I mean, I, I won so badly, it was like ridiculous. And so then he says, okay, you're my, you're my kid, I'm gonna sponsor you. So he sponsored me and we did, we, we did well all over the place. And I have a picture of that coming down the straightaway. And uh, yeah, well that's the early one, honey. That was the early one. Uh, yeah, but anyway, every once in a while the Lord will say, you know, I, I told you, you're a dark horse. That's what he told me. He told me the beginning of my ministry, it's like, oh no. Oh, no, this is terrible. But he said, Rick, you know, David was a dark horse. Oh, I thought, wow, okay, great. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Joseph was a dark horse. Everybody hated him. Oh, okay, okay, great, I get it, you know. And uh, he said, you know, I was a dark horse. I was born in a place where people said, can anything good come out of there? I thought, man, I am glad I am a dark horse. That's awesome, you know, <laughs> not expected to win. So anyway, it encouraged me occasionally when the Lord would bring that to me, like, you know, I know where you're at. I know what's going on. Anyway. So anyway, he says here, you know, that you are reconciled, you are saved through his life. So Jesus is so alive, it's just ridiculous. And you know, the book of Revelation, I mean, he's really alive there, you understand? His face is shining like the sun, you know? He talks to John, and John's dead, you know? And then he talks to the churches, and at least five of those pastors may have died in the pulpit, if you've ever read this chapter 2 and 3. Uh, you know, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm going to blot your name out of the book of life. If you don't return to me, I'm going to turn off your lights. Uh, there had to be a whole lot of shaking going on. But anyway, we got to keep it positive, right? So anyway, but read the B-I-B-L-E. So anyway, so then in chapter 4 and 5, it's about heaven. And by chapter 6, the kings of the earth are trembling and looking for caves to hide from Jesus. So don't worry about the future. The, the one who was humongously bigger than anything that's going on, happens to be with you and happens to have decided to live inside you, I don't think you should have a whole lot to worry if you learn to abide in the Lamb of God. Amen. So I'm not worried about anything, honestly. I say, actually, bring it on. Who wants to continue with our nation going to hell and our neighbors going to hell and us struggling in our marriage or something? Who knows? God, get it on. Anoint us. Come in power and glorify your name. Oh, okay, boy. Oh, I better watch it here. Okay, now, let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Now, this is a key. This is the first of the Beatitudes. Jesus Christ himself, this, I, I would, it'd be my vote. They say, theologians say Romans 8 is the greatest chapter in the Bible. I'd say, well, I don't think Paul would say that. But anyway, since he wrote it, but I would say, you know, the Beatitudes is one of the greatest teachings in all of the Bible because it teaches you how to be a blessed person. And here, I'm going to use the term, it's the word kingdom, but I'm going to use the, the word, the Lord's dominion in your life, okay? When you're angry and you're going before Jesus, you want his dominion, his forgiveness to be stronger than your anger, right? Amen. So, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, some people, I've heard 
prosperity preachers preach this, and it's so perverted as if we're all a bunch of poor people and now we're going to get rich because we got money. No, this is ridiculous. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That word, if you study it out, it means several things. Blessed are those who know they need God. Blessed are those who are humble enough and tender enough to recognize I need you. I'm stuck. Instead of getting angry, instead of getting bitter, which is a waste of time, instead of feeling sorry for myself, self-pity. I bowed down to that dude so many times. I, it's a cul-de-sac. You go down and you can't get out and you go back. It's just a cul-de-sac. It's just a dead end. And there's a few benches along there that you can cry, but it's so wet with everybody else's tears, you don't want to sit on it. Everybody you know has been there, my friend. If you want to sit on my old tears, go for it. But I would recommend you do not get into that. So blessed are those who really know they need the Lord. For there's the kingdom of heaven, the rule of God, will come into their life. Jesus was saying the same thing. You know, you've rejected the prophets. You know, you, you rejected everybody that came. If you only would have known the time of your visitation, if you only would have known I wanted to gather you in my arms, but you wouldn't do it. And therefore, how serious it was. Thousands were crucified. But those who believed in him fled, as he said, and they were preserved. Now, this here, this whole thing of blessed are the poor in spirit, it's so, so important because Jesus is our life. Did I give you Ephesians 1.1? Ephesians 1.1, I want you to see this. People wonder about this. I, I realize it's somewhat of a mystery for sure, but it's also a truth. Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people. Now notice they're in two places at once. They're in Ephesus, the faithful where? The faithful in. Now that word in, E-N, if you look at it in the Greek, it means to be in the environment of, dwelling in the midst of, encompassed by. So I'll say it this way. Those of you who are in the will of God, God's holy people that are living in Ephesus, and the, the city's having an effect on you, but you're now also living in Jesus, who is in heaven, but he's also in you. It's a mystery. And Jesus is in heaven, and you can connect with heaven. In fact, Philippians 3 says you're actually a citizen of heaven. So not only that, we can partake of Jesus Christ. He's in heaven and he's in earth, and we partake of that. And the more spiritual you get, the more you'll have contact with heaven. Seen things in heaven, you know, uh, my wife has. You see things, you see people in heaven, certain people come and so forth. It's all in the heavenly places. They're alive and you're alive. It's all good. So it says here that we're actually in Christ Jesus. We're actually put in the environment of Jesus. So when I'm uptight or whatever, if I'm humble and poor in spirit, meaning teachable. Uh-oh, uh -oh, here's, here's one. This will really, really bother you. Some of you will run out of here. Cor correctable. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Correctable. Teachable. Submitting one to another can't believe I said it. I'm not being stoned. It's a miracle. Oh, thank you, Lord. But that's the way, that's real Christianity. You know, you're you're going you're gonna to be dealt with, but it's always for your good. Aren't you glad your moms and dads told you do not run out in the street as a kid? Aren't you glad? Yeah. Well, you still need to be told things that uh, may not be exactly what you want to hear. But the Lord is always life. So let's, look, let's go back to Matthew 5, and we'll close in a few minutes here. I want to just read through these briefly. Um, <clears throat> Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Um, mourn, if you remember Ezekiel 9, it talks about, I'm going to bring destruction on this city, Ezekiel chapter 9. But it says, go mark those who are grieving over the sins and idolatry that's in Israel. So as we see our nation and the nation's turning more and more away from God, there's a grieving. That's why Pam uh, is calling for prayer. We're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm calling for prayer together, but uh, the burden's really on her. It's on me as well for our nation. Why? Dude, it's rejecting God openly, and it's proud of it. Come on, are you kidding me? Well, Pastor, you know, no, 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 it's very serious. It's very ser That's why I gave you those verses earlier. That's why I gave you those verses earlier. 
Blessed, um, j- just go back to that one more time. Uh, I don't think I, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. He will empower you. He will empower you. You can be mourning over other things, you know. We've had, uh, I'll try to be real quick on this, but we've had many of us as, as baby boomers lose our, our parents. You know, there's a time of mourning. But he will comfort us. It says that when we are comforted, we are able to receive comfort from the Lord and are able to comfort others who are in trials. You know, 2 Corinthians uh, 1, 1, 3 through 9, basically. Blessed are those who mourn. There's a blessing in being grieved and saddened over the condition of our world, our city. Next one. Blessed are the meek. Now, the meek, it's actually a word that means the opposite of those who get angry. Isn't that something? You know, so it's, it's, now, believe me, now, the reason that we can be meek, Jesus is saying, basically, you can be like me and, what, inherit the earth. Why? Because he said, you know, in John, or Matthew 11, 28, 29, uh, come and learn of me. I am meek and humble of heart. I'm easy to talk with. So he's saying, in essence, why don't you be like me? I own the whole earth, and you can too. You can, you can partake of it. It's what the sons of God have to inherit this to be able to, as it were, bring healing to creation, if you remember the eighth chapter of Romans. Blessed are the meek, those who don't get up tight but are soft, tender-hearted people, they're going to inherit the earth. There you go. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. There should be a hunger. As Peter said in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, uh, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may be, you know, that you may grow thereby. I mean, there has to be hunger or that baby's going to die. D- real discipleship is the hunger of God that you seek him. I remember in the 70s, at least the group of people that I got saved with, we became ferociously hunger for the holy word of God. Oh my gosh. And uh, anyway, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You're going to get it, okay? The next verse, okay. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. You know, I love this whole idea of when you forgive people, you're not allowing them to hurt you anymore. It's really true, isn't it? Okay, this is the one that I want. Blessed are the what? Pure in heart, for they shall what? Okay, let's go to Mark now, 720. You had it up earlier. This is very, very important, okay? Jesus wants us to see God. He went on and said what comes out of a person is what defiles them or makes them unclean. For out of the heart, or from within, out of the person's heart, there are what? Evil thoughts, Come sexual immorality, theft, murder, what else? Adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly, whoa. Okay, the, all these come from inside and make you unclean. So the Lord wants to purify your heart so that you can see him and you say, I, I can't, I'm, a, I'm angry at God or I'm bitter, or I'm struggling, and I'm going to alcohol instead. And then then there's no God. Where is God? And you see how we blind ourselves, right? We blind ourselves. So to really be able to see God, go back there to um, that verse. And uh, to be able to really see God, we must allow him to deal with I think it said arrogance, drunkenness, different things that we would turn to that he wants to take these, quote, crutches or things that we go to to satisfy or to numb us or whatever. The whole world's numbing themselves. Come on. I mean, you know, it's unbelievable. You know, the drugs in the schools are younger. The prostitution is younger. It's all, you know, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So you have to have a cleansing. Jesus said, and he would, uh, John, uh, uh, Paul said in Ephesians 5, 27, 26, 27 there, said he'll wash you in the water of his word. As you read your Bible, you are being encouraged, convicted, washed, warned, strengthened, enlightened, empowered, da-da-da-da, all these things. As you allow the word of God you know what? I think the Lord is speaking that verse to me. Then be quiet for a little bit and simply say, let it be done unto me 
according to your word. That's what Mary said. When the angel came to her and said, you're going to have, you're, you're going to, you're going to birth the son of God and you're a virgin. She goes, how can it possibly happen? He said, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And that Holy One shall be called the Son of God. She said, whoa, okay, let it happen. But I'm, I'm mad, okay? Help me, Jesus. I'm lonely, and I turn to this. Okay, we got it. Help me, Jesus. What's the message? You've got to learn to live in God, and you've got to draw on him daily. You were saved at the cross is a past tense, and that's glorious. You are to be saved, sanctified, encouraged, and empowered every day by his life. The eternal life of God flows into your heart. It's available to us. It seems like a trickle at times, but as, listen, as your heart gets purified, you will see God and you will understand more and more about him. This is the key to life. I'm telling you today, these are the keys of life. These are the things from the very lips of Jesus Christ himself, let alone the Apostle Paul and others. But as you learn to humble yourself before the Lord, listen, pride manifests itself in many ways. Do you know the Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble? Oh, you guys know it. So then I have to go before the Lord and say, would you please expose the pride in my heart? I am right in my own eyes in some way. You know, we were, uh, the other day, I, I, I saw one of the big problems today is people have doctrines so stuck in their ears, listen carefully, doctrines so stuck in their ears that they cannot hear what the Spirit's saying. Yeah. This is very, this is a huge thing. I'll just close with this. The teachings in the book of Ephesians are some of the most spiritual teachings in all of Scripture. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We can become the bride of Christ, okay? It gives us spiritual warfare. Timothy was there. Paul established that church for the most part, left Timothy there and so forth. I mean, if there, you've heard me teach this many times. I hope you remember. But they could have said, our church could possibly be the greatest church of the New Testament. Amen. Until Jesus went to it. Until. And then he said, you know, you, you've done pretty good here. You, you are able to recognize false apostles, which the church is probably afraid to even think about. But uh, there are false ones, false teachers, false prophets. And uh, he says, but here's the problem. You've left me your first love. And he says, I'm going to remove your candlestick. That's like saying, I'm turning the power off. Your church is going to die. Okay. And then, of course, he encourages them greatly. Don't misunderstand me. But obviously, that church is not alive today. They could have spread. Those people died and so forth. I get it. But what I'm saying is, is, is that if you believe that prophecy from Jesus Christ, and he talks about all through church history, that is from the New Testament, it all applies to us, but it says we should be hearing what the Spirit is saying. But if people have a doctrine, well, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. That's a doctrinal truth. But whether you are or not will be determined when Jesus begins to look at you. That's the bottom line. That's what I'm saying. We could say, you know, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. People preach that so strongly. I knew, that it, I knew it was a true biblical doctrine, but I also knew that most of the people I knew were not living a righteous life, and their neighbors knew it. You with me? So there's a difference between doctrine and truth. Doctrine is truth, but are we living a holy, righteous life? The only way I can live a holy and righteous life is for Jesus to be my righteousness. So therefore, I have to be poor in spirit. That's the major one. I have to be poor in spirit and say, I can't stop this. I told you, some of you are new. I don't know who you are. But I, uh, when I first came to the Lord, I pretty, got, pretty much got cleaned up, except I still continued to drink, drink way too much beer. And I ended up, actually doing something correct, which I didn't even know it was a scripture, but I told these three guys I was struggling with alcohol, and I didn't know that I was obeying James 5 that said, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. And it took maybe a month or so, two months, I don't remember, and I've never had an issue since. Let's stand up and pray.
Blessed be the Holy Lamb of God. He is 100% for you. He wants, to, I'll just tell you flat out, he wants to snuggle with you. That's the message. I'm just being honest. Women like that better than men. But I'll, I'll tell the men this. He wants to put his arm around you and call you son, okay? That's okay, right? But women, he wants to snuggle. I'm just telling you ahead of time. And, uh, but uh, but here, here's the deal. Here's how you get to really get close to Jesus. Are you ready? You're poor in spirit because that causes the release of the kingdom of God into your life. The kingdom of heaven. I'm struggling, Lord. Yes, be poor in spirit. And not just for six seconds either, right? Okay, I was poor in spirit. Okay, I prayed after church. I'm poor in spirit. Where's God now? No, no, no. It's a lifestyle program things here, folks. It doesn't start overnight. But you just sit there and say, Lord, help me be poor in spirit today. Because I want you to rule me in this area where I'm a loser. I just am not doing it right, Lord. So, okay, here we go. You ready? Heavenly Father, thank you for providing Jesus that I can be saved and delivered by believing in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who gives me his fruit, the very divine nature of God, if I believe in Jesus and yield to the Holy Spirit, I can be obedient. I can forgive. I can overcome many things because of your grace, because of your love. Teach me to live in God. Oh, and Lord, here's a big one. You got quiet. Purify my heart. Help me not be offended. I want to have a pure heart because I want to see you. And if I see you, I will change. If I see myself, if I see my problem, I'll make the wrong decisions. But if I can see you, I can change. Teach me to live in God. Help me be one who makes herself ready a holy vessel set apart unto God. For I am your workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 I am your workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which you have before ordained. You know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. You have ordained works with eternal value for the glory of God. I don't want to miss my calling. Help me be humble from today onward. Help me be correctable and submissive to the Holy Spirit. Give me good friends who will tell me the truth that we can hold one another, hold hands with one another, and cry out to God. Help me, Lord. Walk in the light so that the blood of the Lamb can cleanse me from all sin, all fear, all pride. I got it made if I just trust you. Help me keep my eyes on you, Lord. Amen. I'll say one last thing. You know, one of the things about the worship today, it was very focused People don't come on a time and so forth. But after about 20 minutes or so, it started to get quiet and people were all focused. The worship was focused. The praise was focused all the way through. And you need that focus. That's when the light of the knowledge of the glory of God starts to rest upon you. That's, what ha that's why I'm preaching this because it's happening to me in my prayer closet. I'll finish with this last statement. Here's the most important thing. Courtship for the bride has begun. And in our generation, it's begun 2,000 years ago. In our generation, but where he courts you is in your personal one-on-one -on -one times. And with good friends and fellowship, obviously. But I'm telling you, courtship has begun. Don't say no to the Lamb of God. Amen. God bless you. The ministry team's coming up. Yeah. Yep, my wife's got something here. Can you give her a, that purple mic? Because I know, that's okay, I could take Rick's ear thing. Okay, I, I just really want to just 
revisit this for one second because I know Rick wanted to say this. I felt it so strong from the Lord, but I just wanted to revisit. We've known Sandro for 25 years. 25 years. He's been with us, and he and Carla, you know, his sister, lived together, were very close, loved one another, and I, I just, Rick and I were so, I don't want to say proud because it's not us. We, it was so powerful to see Sandro stand up at the end in front of neighbors that knew them, friends that are not saved, do not know the Lord. And he, if you want to read it, it's on his Facebook page as well as Carla's. And it was so powerful as he declared um, the Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life. And he, the way you said it, I'm not going to do it justice, but the way he said it, he said better than fame, uh, better than all wealth, better than anything the world could offer, to have the assurance that Carla is eternally alive and saved in heaven and that I will see her again. I mean, it was so powerful, Sandro. You did an incredible, incredible job. And I just, we're so proud of you. And uh, we just, we want to keep Sandro in prayer, keep him in your hearts because of the season of adjustment. They, I've, I've rarely seen a brother and a sister so, so close. And uh, you're so special, Sandro, and your heart, it, it shone out for everybody to see as well as Carla's, yours too, and uh, we are just, we were blown away by it. I'm, was he was there powerfully, oh, I so. Forgot. Yeah. I forgot, when I walked in, I ran into the love of God, and I thought I was going to lose it when I walked into the home. No, seriously. I thought, oh my gosh. So we, we, we just love you, Sandro, and we're, we just thank you that we're in the same family, and uh, we're going to walk through this together. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen.